So are, uh, are you ready to uh, come alive? Yes. All right, me too. So I, uh, you know, I was here Wednesday night when they were practicing that song, and I couldn't believe how, how it was knitting t- uh, so closely together with where we're at in Scripture and kind of where we're at really kind of at the end of the, what I would hope is the end of this pandemic season that we've been in. And this season that for a lot of people of isolation, a season for a lot of people of uh, great difficulty in being apart from family. Today is the first time my, my mother's going to take a trip uh, to her other uh, great-grandchildren in Santa Rosa with our son. And I know that she's, she's excited about that. And my mother has severe COPD where she's on oxygen. And, and so this is an opportunity. You know, she's like, well, do I live my life in isolation or do I live what's left of my life with family and with friends? And that God's got a calling on everyone's life, and sometimes that it appears as though that it kind of gets in a shadow or it gets put on pause, but really God was doing great things during the pandemic as well, especially in those hearts that were fixed on him. He's going to continue to do a work. And this morning, as we go through some of these scriptures, I want to kind of just give you just a little bit of what we said last week in a, in a sentence. And what we said last week during the Easter message was that God's given us all right, peace, and a, uh, a purpose, and a, and a power to carry it out, all right? So he's given us his peace through the cross, through the blood of the cross. He's given us a purpose, and he's given us the power to carry it out. I love asking people questions sometimes, and I'll ask them, I say, what does it mean to be a Christian? What, it, what was it like, excuse me, the first day you believed? Tell me what you were doing that first six months of believing, of coming to faith, you know, and and then what's your li- what's, how's your life different now than it was when you first believed? And, and many times, you know, God sanctifies us through different seasons. And I believe he's been sanctifying the church through this season of isolation. And it's time to come alive. All right? That's, that's kind of where, where I feel that we are as a church. And I feel that that's where I am as a person. And, and if any of you can relate to this, then this message is for you. And so, but all of us should be able to relate to the scripture no matter where we're at. And so this morning, for some of us, it's going to be a time of repentance. For some of us, it's going to be a time of remembering. And for some of us, it's going to be a time that the Holy Spirit will will reactivate something that he's already placed in us for a purpose and reminds us that we have a purpose and reminds us that he's given us the power to carry it out. So we're going to walk through Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bible, we'll, we'll go through up here. But I'm hoping and praying that the Lord really speaks to our body this morning about what's next and where are we going. And, and not only that, but you as an individual, what is God speaking to you? So how many of you remember the story of uh, the road, uh, you know, the, the men that were walking to Emmaus, oh, yeah. right? Well, that story, I'm just going to summarize it really quickly. That story occurred at, at, at the day of Jesus' resurrection. So we're still kind of talking about the old and the new. Today's the last day that we're going to go over the old and the new. And so in that day of uh, the old covenant being passed away, the new covenant approaching, Christ being alive and made new from the grave, right? And, and, and he brings that, that, that message to his, his apostles, to his disciples. And then, but on the road to Emmaus, he sees these two men walking. And these two men walking are confused as to what just happened. They're talking about what happened to Jesus. Did you see what happened? They were walking and talking. Jesus appears to them on this road as they are traveling. And he's listening to them, and he goes, what's wrong with you? What's the matter? He goes, haven't you heard? Are you like the only person on the planet that hadn't heard about Jesus, this man who came and did all these wonderful works, and then he was put to death, and he was put in a grave, and in fact, we've even heard that he's not even in the grave no more. In other words, someone may have stole his body. We don't really know. And they didn't know they were talking to Jesus, and they were just having this conversation. He continues in the conversation, and then... They, they asked him, um, you, know, why, you know, basically, why haven't you heard? And then he turns to them, and he starts basically sharing with them the word of God. And he talks about what the prophets had said. 
And he talks about what was going to happen to the Messiah. And he talks about the resurrection. And he's explaining to, to them exactly what he had just gone through in his life, and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And they were listening to him. And then he pretended, it says he pretended to walk away from them. And they go, wait a minute, don't go. Don't go. They still didn't know who this was. But they're like, something's going on here. He was speaking the word of God to them. And they were coming alive from a place of walking and wondering what just happened. And they were like, don't go. And they even invited him to go home. I am so amazed at how many times after the resurrection of Jesus, I can count at least four times, when he encounters the person, he speaks to their hearts, right? Right where they're at. And then he breaks bread with them. Then he has a meal with them. And so they took him home and he says, here, come to my house, come to my house. And he said that when he broke bread with them, they suddenly realized who he was. And then he says he disappeared because he was in a transcendent state. He disappeared. And they were like, oh my gosh, what just happened? This is the day those two men first believed. And they looked and they, they looked at each other and the scripture says this. And this we pick up in Luke 24, 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. This morning, my prayer is that this word, this word of God, as we open up the scripture, that your heart would burn, that your heart would, would, would come alive, if you will, because of the name of Jesus, but because of the words that come forth from Jesus, because of who he is, what he's done, and when he's coming back, and all of those wonderful things that he's promised, right? He promised to raise up from the dead. He did, right? And now he's given us the power, he says, of the resurrection. He's given us a new life for us to walk in. And many of us forget this, right? I mean, I try to remind myself daily at times. You get a little weary, or you get a little maybe discouraged, or something comes your way. And you know God's going to use it because he works everything for good. But there's sometimes that you can lull yourself Way, away, away, away. You haven't left him. He hasn't left you, but you've kind of lulled yourself asleep, if you will. You lulled yourself away, and you forget how it was when your heart burned for him and for the word of God and, and how you became alive and you, your, your, your deadness was made alive. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, and then Christ made you alive with him. Anybody remember that day? Anybody have fallen asleep? Don't, don't raise your hand, especially right now if you're sleeping. I mean, how can you raise your hand if you're sleeping right now, okay? I don't know how you do that. But my, my hope is this morning for all of us, for all of us, that whatever's left that God would have for you while you were here on this side of heaven, that it would come alive in the name of Jesus and come alive for him and for others and for people that are still walking blindly and not knowing him. And God's given us, I told you last week, that purpose. He's given us that message. He's given us that mission. He told them, he goes, listen, I want you to go and do what I just did. Josh just, just said, you know, and he's right. Sometimes we get hung up on the miraculous. No, the greater thing is the more the kingdom is built on the foundation of your testimony and what God has done in your own life. And so, we'll pick up this passage in Colossians 3, 1. I kind of read through it at the very beginning of the old and new, and everyone's going, oh my God, that's a tall task. And I did it on purpose because I, I wanted at the beginning of this to, sit, to sense the weight of the calling of a Christian. But now that we're on this side of the resurrection, I want you to understand the, the opportunity that we have as Christians to walk this out like this. It's beautiful. It's, some, it's one of the hardest things that you will ever do and also one of the most, the, 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 the most awesome thing that you will ever do is to live outside of yourself for the sake of Christ and for the sake of one another. It's hard, but it's so good. It's so good. It's hard when you're trying to work out of your own self to do it. But when you understand the power of the resurrection and he does live inside of us, it's like what we were called to do. And he goes ahead of us to do it. So look at this in Colossians 3. 
If you have been raised with Christ, how many believe in the death of Jesus? How many believe in the burial of Jesus? How many believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Now, if you really believe in the resurrection of Jesus, raise your hand. Okay, so it says this. If you have been raised with Christ, you have been, if you believe in the resurrection, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So the first word I want to just hone in on in verse 1 is seek. So the first thing that we must do is right now begin to seek the things above. We need to seek the things of the kingdom, not on earth, but of him. We need to be, we need to be passionate about looking for him, receiving him, having a desire for him, that we would seek him. The next thing, he, that, that set our minds on things that are above, not on earth, that we need to literally begin to seek him and to set our attention on things above, not on earth, because it's so easy to see what's down here. Now, he, God didn't say to ignore it. He just says to set your minds on above. So if you see a problem, you can focus on the problem, you can bring the problem to attention, you can talk about the problem all day, just like the guys on the road to Emmaus. They just talk about the problem. And all of a sudden, Jesus enters into the problem. Now, all of a sudden, their heart burns with desire. They weren't even seeking him. He sought them out. And when you first came to Christ, if you go back there, you will find yourself in the same place that he, he sought you out. And now we are to continue to seek him, to seek him. He says this, he says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life? We're going to come back to that. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Is Christ your life? Because if Christ is your life, you will always have a life. If Christ, who is your life, is your life, then you never lose. I met a man one time. He was a world champion karate guy. He used to go to church here, Alex Malati. He told me one day that, 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 that basically he grew up in the Muslim faith. And, and so when he heard about Jesus, because he was very competitive and because he was very like into winning, he heard that at the end, Jesus wins. He goes, I want to be on that team. <laughs> if Jesus is your life, he wins. If sports is your life, you don't always win. If fishing is your life, you don't always catch a fish. I want you to think deeper than that, though. What is it that your hands are holding on to that might possibly be of this earth that can easily be taken away? But if Jesus, who is your life, and all things come in and through him and by him, then it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you don't have. He becomes your life. And this is how we have life. And what is an abundant life anyway? The abundance of life is more of him. It's more of him. He is your life. He gave you life. He took you from death and made you alive. You have now been risen in him. And he says, hey, I want you to put this on. Take it with you. Take me with you wherever you go. Put me on. And, and, and if you've been raised with me, then seek me. He says, set your minds on me, not on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden. What does this mean? My life is hidden in Christ. That means even though I'm, a, I'm still a sinner, even though that I still am going to fall short, my life is hidden in Christ. I'm protected by him. He has got me covered. There's just no greater security than to know that my life, your life, is hidden in Christ, who is your life. So again, who is your life? Is Christ your life? Look at first thing that we need to do if we really want to come alive in Christ is to ask yourself, is he your life? And if he is your life, then the next thing to come alive in Christ is to seek him who is your life. Verse 5. Okay, here we go. Here comes time for repentance. So we're seeking him. We're going to put our eyes on him. But sometimes in order for something to come alive, something first must die. All of us, unless he comes back, will die physically. And then... We are born again, 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 spiritually, immediately into a real new life, which is Christ himself in the, in the person, right? 
So anything that's going to have a new life sometimes must die. I have this beautiful, uh, this, this fireman at UC Davis gave me a milk carton one day, and it was like an old school milk carton, and he said, hey, Bob, I want to give you a gift. And it was a milk carton with dirt in it with a stick, a little stick in it like this big, and I laughed at him. I go, what, what is that? He goes, that's a Rose of Sharon. I never knew that this man was, was watching or listening my life. He goes, I know that's in the Bible. I don't know what it means, but I know that that's a Rose of Sharon. I said, okay. So I stuck it in the ground. It looked dead. It looked dead. I stuck it in the ground. It became alive. It's all I could do to cut it back every year. It just keeps going and going. And going. It's the most beautiful plant. And then I recalled, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to have one of those out her window. But it would die every year. So this year, I'm going to show you guys later, not today, but when it's all done. I've been taking a series of pictures of this stick that's now like a big bush. And at the end of every year, I know I've got to go cut it back or it's going to take over the whole yard. But it has these beautiful flowers, but it, it looks dead. It has to go through a season, if you will, of, 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 of going dormant. And many of us do. But that is only to make Jesus bigger. It's not to put you in a place of pity or woe is me or to put you in a corner. It's only a place of suffering for a little season in order that you can come alive. And many of us are in that place too. But I have these pictures of it's dead, then a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what has to die in us? This is what it says in Colossians. Put to death Therefore, verse 5, what is earthly in you? Put to death what is earthly in you. The first pieces are all about sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, des evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. These are, these are things, right? Some scriptures say fornication, which is sex outside of marriage, or to lust after someone that you're not married to. All of these things need to be put to death. And if that relates to you, God wants to just put it to death. It's not like forget about it or just hope it goes away. No, but that you would come to Jesus and say, put this to death in my life. When you resurrected, all things were new. This is some old man idea, this old concept of mine. I, I really desire you, Jesus. I'm seeking after you. I'm putting my mind on you. I'm going to walk this thing out. Would you please put that to death? You do not have the power to overcome that stuff. He does, and he will, all right? So he says, and these you once walked. I did. Josh did. We once walked there. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, twice, when you were living in them. Yes, I, that was my life. But now you must put them all away. Oh man, these are hard ones. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. This is nothing that Jesus would co-sign. Listen, when anger rises up in me, thank God the Spirit of Christ rises up even more. First convicts me of it, tries to temper it down, tries to hold it down. Anger will come, but so will Jesus. You might have anger. That's a dead thing. That's an earthly thing unless it's of justice and, and you understand that. But, but if it leads to sin, that's not a good thing. And God will come and, and actually put that dead thing and bring something else to life. What is that? Patience. Patience. Where did that come from? Hmm. Maybe that's what needs to come alive in these places. But you should... Also, remember, don't be slandering anyone. Don't be talking bad about anybody. Don't have obscene talk out of, coming out of your mouth. It was funny. We were having a little good time. at the, We got, things got a little relaxed at the board meeting the other day. And I told an old, old joke. I said, warning, this is an old joke. Probably not a Christian joke. And then another brother said, yeah, I got an old joke too. And I'm not kidding. I, I could read you the text. Kirk Funk sent a, sent a text and it said, let no obscene talk come out of your mouth. <laughs> Pastor Craig read it first. I went, oh, Lord. You know, here's someone taught me this one time. Uh, you can never talk behind God's back. <laughs> no matter how hard you try, you can never talk behind his back. You have really no secrets. 
But here he comes. Mercy, grace, forgiveness, grace. That's what leads a man to repentance. Not the law, not me telling you don't do this. God wouldn't co-sign it, no. That he would still accept you and then begin to change you. That's the grace of God. That's the mercy of God. And then he goes on. He says, he goes, uh, don't lie to one another. Oh, my gosh. You know, Satan is the father of lies. We once walked there. I could tell a lie to tell another lie to tell another lie. I, I had, a, I had a, a lying father, and I had a lying tongue. And when Jesus comes, we put off the old, we put on the new. I can't tell you how many times my, I went to sleep at night completely sound asleep at night because I told the truth. The truth literally does set you free. So what is God calling a Christian to do? Just tell the truth. I've got a problem. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, you want a friend? You want a, you want a, you want a friend? Don't tell them all the things that you know how to do. Tell them where you're stuck. Don't lie. Then he goes on, he goes, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and then put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Remember we talked about that, that, that God comes and, 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 and through Jesus and he becomes the, the new man and now we're, we were first created in the image of God and now we're in the image, if you will, of Christ, the new creation. He says, knowledge and, and knowing that we're in the image now of its creator, Jesus. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Christ is all in all now. We are not divided by denomination. We're not divided by color of skin. We're not divided by continent. We're not divided by what sin you do and what sin I don't do. We're all free in Christ. You know, I read that, that in uh, Carthage, Carthage in, the, in that Colosseum, I'm not sure what part of the country or the world this was in, but in 210 A.D., it was the first time ever recorded that not only a Christian, right, was given over to the lions, but a Roman, and it was a woman, a matron of Rome, who, who came to faith in Christ by her slave girl. And now they both, because of their faith, it didn't matter if they were Roman, it didn't matter if they were a slave they were both in Christ. You see how it's all gone? But for them, it meant they were led to the lions. There's no longer should be any distinction. You can't distinguish yourself between an addict or an attorney. You can't distinguish yourself between a homeless person and someone in Beverly Hills. You cannot do that. God does not do that. You know, you can go to some other countries where they live in a caste system. They have many gods. But not in Christ. There is one God, one creator. We're all made in that image. And we once used to be under the kingdom of darkness, and now we're in the kingdom of light, and it should look like that. And so he goes on. He says, uh, um, okay, so I'm just going to pause there and tell you this. In order to come alive... Some things must die. Okay? Whatever that is. And the Holy Spirit fills in the blank every time we preach. May not be anything here, but it could be something here, here in you. And so I want to read something to you in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Wow. So this is when uh, John saw a revelation of Jesus speaking to the churches. And he speaks to the church of Ephesus. And he tells the Ephesus church, he goes, you know, it's great that you guys are found, founded on doctrine, and it's great that you guys have, uh, that, that you are against false teaching. I see that. He said it's really good. He, he kind of lifts them up. And then he says this to them. He says, but, he says, I do have one thing against you. This is what he said that I, in verse 4. But I have this against you, church. He says, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Does that relate to anyone here? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Do the works that you did when you first believed. 
when the passion of Christ burned within you, the word was something that was coming alive to you. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Those of us that have been a valley of acor or a valley or a season of deadness and we have brought that deadness onto ourselves because we have not let him love us or not loved others or whatever has gotten in the way, today is a day of repentance. That is kindness leads you to a place of repentance. Repent, repentance is a place of understanding that God would rather have you be somewhere else than when you, where you are right now. And then we get into these passages of scriptures with that being said. So in order for us to come alive, some of us need to repent. And then we go to the, we, we carry on in the book of Colossians, verse 12. So then put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Put on a compassionate heart. Don't just look for your needs, but look for the needs of others. Have compassion. These are not things you can just make up. These are things that he's given you as one of his chosen holy ones. You understand that? These attributes are Christ who lives in you. You don't have to white knuckle it. You don't have to make it up. The Holy Spirit is available to every believer for these things to emanate out of the Christian. You're chosen. You're holy. You're loved. So have compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. There's a whole sermon series in just those four or five things. Bearing with one another. Notice how now he shifts the writing to the believer into relationship. Relationship. In order for Christ to come alive, we must be in relationship with one another. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive them. Forgive each complaint as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. It's amazing how often we see forgiveness in the scripture. If you want to come alive and you feel dead, you may check your heart to see if there's unforgiveness. You may check your heart to see if there's bitterness. You may check your heart to see if you're in competition with someone. You may check your heart. And that could be what's stopping your heart. And God says, forgive. If you got a complaint, then go talk. Forgive. Moving on. Above and 14, right? So if we're going to come alive, we must forgive. And above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. See, when you forgive someone and you forgive someone in love, right, it's all done in a redeeming way. It's not you hurt me, I forgive you. No, it's you hurt me, I forgive you, and I'm going to work towards this love thing. Not everybody can reconcile themselves to the degree of sitting at a table for dinner. I'm not saying that. But you're going to know in your heart whether you've truly, truly loved that person enough to forgive them. You may not ever love what they did or what they've done. That's the reason why you hurt. But you must forgive the sinner. That will come. Man, I, I, there was a brother here in the church and he, he got saved, and he was late 60s, and he runs mobile meals. I have permission to tell you this. And he got in a real sideways thing with his family, a big family, and he was at odds with all of them. And he wasn't a Christian for very long, and he knew this was a dead thing. This was an earthly thing, and he knew that he must go and forgive. And so one at a time, one at a time, he didn't tell them what they did wrong. He told them what he did wrong. He said, listen, I'm sorry. I want relationship with you. And he said, one by one by one by one by one by one, the walls fell. This was years and years of frustration in that family. And one by, he says, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't wait to go to the next brother and the next sister. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. I think there were eight brothers and sisters. I couldn't wait. He goes, I almost, <laughs> you got to know him. He's a funny man. He says, I almost want to go, go, go hurt someone else and, and so that I have to forgive them again because it was so good, right? He was coming alive. Forgiveness made him alive because it's the heart of Christ in a believer that forgives someone. We don't have the power to do that. It's Christ, the hope of glory. And so then he goes on, he says, 
Let the peace, let the peace, he says, and above all, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Man, you want perfect harmony? And you want peace? Then these attributes are available to us. And then he goes on and he says, um, uh, and, and let the peace of Christ rule in your heart to which indeed you were called one body. And then here's, here's a little bitty sentence, three words, and be thankful. Oh my gosh. You know, you know, you know that you know that you know a beautiful heart when that heart becomes grateful. You start to realize that no matter what, I can be content because my life is in Christ. But anything I get beyond a breath of life, I'm thankful for. I'm just thankful. A grateful person is a person made alive. You know, people that are not grateful, I'm sorry to go here, but every now and then I just kind of have to. But people that are not grateful, they're still in the grave. They're just still in the grave. They have a complaint. They have a woe is me. They have a real critical nature. They want to dig up everybody else's grave, not realizing that they're digging a deeper grave for themselves. And, it's, and God is just saying, listen, I, I want life for you. That's not life. And I've given you all that you need. And in Peter, 2 Peter says, I've given you all that you need for life and godliness. I've even given you my divine nature, God says. He's jealous, he says, for the spirit that he's put in us. That's what God says. Use it. He wants relationship. He wants to come and see you on the road and see you, you know, and, and complain or concern and then have a meal with you. He wants you to come alive. And by the way, food keeps you alive. He is the bread of life. He says this. I love this. And then he goes on, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now listen, the word of Christ dwell in you. In other words, it's not just here. It's living in you. And it's applied on a daily basis. When you read this, forgive one another, you go, Lord, I need to forgive. Dwell that word. Dwell in me and may it come alive in me. May forgiveness, your word of God, come alive in me. Not just on paper, not just on a Sunday morning, but may the word dwell in me richly and produce now, how's the word going to dwell in you richly unless you're daily in the word? I, I love it, you know, with, I don't know what is going on, but older people and younger people have been coming to me saying, that, man, it's the first time ever I pick up a Bible every day. And you can see a marked difference in those people. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, available, uh, 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 able to divide the soul, the spirit, the, the bone and the marrow and the very intentions of a man's heart. The word of God, it's alive and active. It says, let it dwell in you richly. Some of us need to come alive again in the word. Remember on the road to Emmaus, they go, weren't, weren't our hearts just burning when he opened the scriptures to us? Do you realize the words of Jesus are found in this book and they could come alive again every time you open it up privately or you listen to it on a, on a podcast or whatever. Fill your hearts with the Lord of God, Word of God. Excuse me. A little, little, little. <laughs> Fill your hearts with the Word of God and may it come alive in you. It's powerful. I wish I could just stop right now and give you a testimony of what's going on in our youngest son's life. The word of God, the power of God, the purposes of God, the peace of God. This is a resurrected life. This is an abundant life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, I'm working on that one, and hymns <laughs> and spiritual songs, still working on that one too. With thankfulness in your hearts. There it is again. So when we praise God, it's not just to sing in church. It's to praise God for his goodness. It's to, don't, don't look around you. Just praise him in the sanctuary for the goodness of God. With spiritual songs and hymns and 
Some people come to church and go, I just, I just want to hear the word. Some people come to church, I just want to hear the music. I got news for you. It's not about you. It's him. It's him. And he's in your giving. He's in your singing. He's in the word. He's in your one another's. He's everywhere all the time. And he is good. And we should praise him. We should be thankful for him. Man, that song that we were singing, Come Alive, that artist has another one. It says, soul, don't be shy. David used to talk to his soul, too, in Scripture. This is nothing unusual. He would say, soul, don't be anguished, but rise up. Speak to your soul and say, don't be shy. Praise him. I live for the day. I hope I, I, hope I don't go to my grave before I hear everyone in the church just praising his name. Just praise him. It changes your outlook. It changes your, your order of thinking. It changes you because it's him. You want an abundant life? Be filled with him. Be an image bearer. Pick up a cross. Repent. Go love on somebody. Maybe go to the person that you never, ever, ever even thought that you would have a meal with and say, come to my house and eat. Be a Christian. And whatever you do in word or deed, this, this is for people that are still going to work. Whatever you do. How many people go to work and come home and complain about their job? Don't raise your hand, especially if you work here. I don't have nobody to complain to. <laughs> Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Whatever you do, I don't care if you're, you know, cutting the grass or you're, you know, you're helping your child or you're teaching school or, or cooking a meal. Whatever it is, do it in, in him, Amen. for him, yes, through him. Do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is, this is a really good place to segue into we come alive when we serve. We come alive when we serve. I wish we could continue to go through what coming alive looks like in your own house. Go home and read the next verses about husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. This is a good life. But it's going to take his life in us for us to come alive. And all you got to do is say, help. Help me. There's a man watching right now online named Garrett. Garrett, you're about to come alive. I know what it's like to be dead. And I know what it's like at periods of time in my walk with Christ to get lazy, to get complacent, to forget what it was like when my heart burned within me for the word or for what I forget what it like, what, it, what I first did. I couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus when I was first saved. Is that you? He's still here. He's walking with you on your way to Emmaus. He's alive. He didn't think that the guys at Emmaus, they go, didn't you hear what happened to him? Today is the third day. Today is the third day. And he was right there. He's right here, right now, with every single one of you. I will just say this, that I really, truly believe that this church, this church, community, uh, the body of Christ community is coming alive. Some people, they, they've never gone dormant, but in whole, I believe we're coming alive. And I know that God's given a purpose to every person in here to be a member of the body, not just an attender, but to be a member of the body of Christ so that the whole body comes alive. There's something in your heart that God's given you that this body needs. 
There's something inside of you as a purpose. There's some kind of gifting. There's something, that a treasure that God's put in you that you've not even necessarily realized that's about to come alive. And for some of you, for the first time, possibly Jesus is coming alive in your heart right now. And I say that and I ask that if that's you, the way it comes alive has nothing to do with me or anyone in here. It's God's grace that opens up a heart and ears and eyes to see, to hear, and then to believe. And if you want to come to faith in Christ, we would love, like Katerina is here this morning, raise your hand, Katerina, like Katerina did last week. If there's anyone here this morning that's never had their sins forgiven, had their trespasses put aside by the blood of Christ, then we just would love for you to raise your hand. That's it. Just raise your hand. Confess him before men, and he will confess you before the Father, and be saved. Be saved from eternal separation from God and been given the Holy Spirit to walk this life out all things new. Anybody here this morning? Just raise your hand. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to see you through that. Garrett, if you're listening, you send a note. Send a note to Abel. He loves you. Anyone here? Okay, let's pray. Musicians will come up. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your tender mercies. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that's alive in our hearts this morning. And we pray that we truly would come alive, Lord. We truly would come alive, Lord, for your sake and for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.